Well, my name is Antoinette Lorraine. Um, I, I live in Cardiff. Uh, I haven't been far out of Cardiff. I went to London for a few years when I was quite young and I did live in Holland for nine years um, and then I returned to Cardiff. Um, so how did I get involved in volunteering? It's... Oh, I was in London actually. I was, I was quite young, yeah, I was about 18 and I went to live in, in London and I actually ended up having quite a good job in London in Berkeley Square at quite a young age. And in the evenings I went to help out at a project called BIT. Oh, firstly, I remember now, firstly I went to help out at um, Simon Community for a little while. Yeah, I remember that now. That was um, a place for uh, homeless people, alcoholics, and uh, not that that equates necessarily, but it, you know, there were various types of people there. Um, but I ended up somehow in BIT. I can't recall how I came to be in BIT. Um, I was quite impressed with, um, with BIT. Uh, because it was a type of switchboard organisation because you can imagine in London there were lots of people coming through from all over the world and um, I remember it was in Ladbroke Grove and how I helped is that I was quite good at administration because that was my job during the day and so I would sort of help the uh, coordinator there um, by yeah, typing up lots of reports that he had to do, etc. So that's what I did. I, I don't recall why I got involved in volunteering. It's quite a strange thing now that you ask me because um, I do know that at that age, like many people that age, I felt like I wanted to change the world and so it just seemed to be in my DNA. <laughs> I think I was born, born wanting to do that. And um, yeah, and how I ended up in BIT, I, I can't recall. But anyway, I did that for the whole of the time that I was in London. And um, so I, I met a lot of people there, saw a lot of things there. I remember that um, some of the talking to some of the people there and they were a little bit uh, bitter about the way things were in society and they I remember being accused of oh you're coming here you just want to paper over the cracks mm -hmm. um, but anyway I was young what could what could I what could I do or what could I know I just um, did a bit there um, and so that's how it started and I actually did return to Cardiff and again I can't recall how I ended up being involved with RIB. I, I know that I went to the student union and I was thinking about this. I think I must have asked for a meeting with um, someone in the student union. Um, Maybe I suggested that they be involved in something like BIT in Cardiff and I think that's how it might have come, come to be because I tried to think about it and I, I just can't think of any other way that would have happened. And there was a man called Dave Smith and he was, um, yeah, he was involved with the student union and so I had meetings together with him and um, and he got the, this building in Charles Street, 58 Charles Street, uh, at a peppercorn rent and uh, actually installed me in it really and that's how it started. And um, it was meant to be a project uh, similar to, to BIT but of course Cardiff, it was very different to London, absolutely. But nevertheless, uh, we were there and um, we had, um, uh, yeah, I don't know, it, all, it just all started once we were there and we had volunteers 
came to to help and um, we had a, like an open door policy what I do remember is that um, over the years that RIB which was Rights and Information Bureau were in existence um, we did various things it depended on who came to volunteer you know what we could do and what we could offer but certainly it was an open door policy so we would get people who would come and sit in there um, yeah sometimes it was people you know who were in really dire straits or you just had somewhere to come and sit for a while um, and we were an information service primarily so if people called to ask various information then we would do our best um, to give them the information. I think we saw it as a place where for people who wouldn't go to the establishment, you know, to the council offices that they could come to us. We were uh, like an intermediary. Um, a lot of things went on there. You know, when I look back now, it's like surprises me because I'm thinking, oh yeah, a lot of people came through the place, came in to, in to help and to offer help and yeah, just to volunteer and give time. Um, we ended up one time there with the little someone, actually I remember him well, someone who had sat there for days on end, weeks on end, months on end, you know, and then he ended up doing, because we had two rooms, he ended up doing um, a little kitchen in one of the rooms, just making soup and and then uh, people from outside. Um, I remember people like Pete Raymond from the Welsh National Opera and other people like that came in and had lunch there. Um, yeah, I, I know that the only way that we could fund ourselves was to have things like jumble sales. And in those days, jumble sales, they were very big. You know, you could earn a lot of money having jumble sale in those days. And we also had uh, benefit concerts. We had bands like Brinchley Swartz and Black Sabbath and Hawkwind and Deep Purple. And they actually came and did concerts for us and to raise some funds. Um, I also know, remember that we did some placements. Sometimes um, some social workers came to do some placements there because, you know, I, I can't totally pinpoint what it is we did, you know, but obviously for them it was very useful for them to come to a place like that and to see what was happening on you know grassroots level um, the type of um, things that people were going through and you know some people who just can't you know they just fall into a, a circumstance where it's really difficult for them to get out of it I mean we gave um, advice on, well, whatever. I was thinking, I don't think we gave benefits advice because we didn't have training sessions and things like that. But we would point people in um, the right direction to where they could get advice, you know. Um, I'm trying to think of what else because we were very busy, we were open from I think 10 in the morning till 10 at night so we had to have like a, a rota of volunteers who were there. Um, we also set up like a, we called it a crash pad list where people who were passing through Cardiff needed somewhere to stay you know travellers or something we could phone um, someone on the list and ask them if they would um, put up someone for that night uh, and it was amazing how many people were on the list you know who were willing and I remember we had people some Americans who you know were uh, very upset and a bit traumatized because they had been involved in Vietnam and mm -hmm. things like that you know um, yeah 
And we had, I, I remember, I think some of the things that really stick in my mind is uh, some of the characters who came in. And um, I'm sure that it was, um, what's the word, a, a foundation for some of the characters who just came in and sat there. It, I think it was like home to some of them. I mean, we, we couldn't have loads of people coming to sit there, and it didn't work like that anyway, but there were some regulars, you know, that, that came in and... Um, yeah, just maybe it was a little bit of a haven for them, I don't know. <laughs> and I always remember one, I mean, it, it was really quite a funny occurrence because I don't really know who he was and he just sat there. It was the one who set up the cafe in the end, but he sat there for months on end. He didn't say a word to anyone. And then I remember we needed some more volunteers and we'd um, advertised and we had... Uh, we were like interviewing people to see if they would be, it would work for them to be there. Because some people were coming from other cities as well. And I remember just talking, mentioning to my colleague about one person and this man who just sat there piped up and said, yes, but would he have the personality? <laughs> and I just remember going into hysterical laughter because that was probably the only thing he said for the whole of the month. So he'd been taking everything in, watching everything and listening to everything. But anyway, that was, um, yeah, I mean, I just look at this photograph and, um, you know, I can see that there's, Plen there was plenty going on there, but I, I can't remember it all. Not all of it, anyway. Yeah, but... Can you <laughs> tell me about the photograph? You know that, how that came about. Um, yeah, the photograph was... Um, this was taken by someone... Actually, it was Paul Harrison, and he'd come... He was working for the Western Mail at the time. And... Um, he he came to do an article about Rib for the paper and he, he took the photograph. Uh, and actually, I did become friends with him and his wife because um, they, they moved to live in London and he became um, an author. And, um, and they were very interested in what we were doing there. And I remember that we were about to do... Uh, I, we were helping to go around Cardiff, you know, counting, seeing how many homeless people there were, and we were part, helping with that project, and so I remember that he came with his wife, and he accompanied us all around Cardiff at that time, um, looking for homeless people to try to gauge how many people were, you know, slipping rough in Cardiff. Yeah, so... But many people came through the doors, you know, in and out, and yeah, and uh, so it was a bit like a switchboard in a way, pointing people to appropriate places, and um, yeah, but a lot of people helped there, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I, if I remember rightly, I earned about five pounds a week if that. Um, mainly we had uh, benefit concerts, um, people like Black Sabbath, Deep Purple, Hawkwind, Bringley Swartz, they did benefit concerts for us. Um, and also we had jumble sales because in those days there were lots of jumble sales and there were queues to go to jumble sales and we could earn you know, money doing jumble sales. Um, but, yeah, I suppose m when I think back it sounds ridiculous, but money didn't seem very important to me then. And um, people were very, very uh, kind, generous and helpful to me because a lot of people knew I was there working for not much at all. And, um, for instance, you can see on the photograph this girl here, Liz, who was volu a volunteer, she came out of one of her, f uh, of her flat, sorry, and, um, and I moved into it, and it was absolutely cheap. I mean, it just shows how times have changed. Everything was so, so much, so different then. You could survive on not much money then. 
Um, so I moved into her flat and it was really, really cheap, but a good flat. Um, and yeah, you know, you'd, you had um, the open air fruit market, you'd go down there looking for cheap fruit and vegetables and things, so we just lived differently then. And it was possible, I don't, I don't know if you could do it now really, but you know, so that was how I um, survived, but it didn't feel like surviving, I suppose, I, yeah. I wasn't someone who came out of school and I did work in an office and as I say I worked in in an office in London when I was there but I, I yeah I sort of started and stopped gave it up quite quickly in that moment I couldn't see myself doing that forever being in an office like that but anyway um, and volunteering yeah we we there were, there were always people who wanted to, to volunteer, who wanted to, to come in and help in some way or another. So it was, in a way, it was quite a creative process because different volunteers had different ideas or different skills. Um, and so lo lots of things went, went on there. Um, I think, you know, for me, eventually, when I, I can, I can only see the positive side of it now, but when I look back, I can also see that it was quite trying to work in a place like that because, yes, you are seeing everything on the grassroots level with uh, people who couldn't manage or cope with their lives for whatever reason, and. Um, and this was around us all day, evening, every day. And um, so there was, it was also stressful. And sometimes the stress could come from the people who volunteered because of group dynamics. You know, we had, you can imagine we had meetings every week and meetings are not always easy. But our basic, the basic idea was there to, we were a switchboard basically, that was the basis of it, to give information to people who wouldn't otherwise uh, have access to information and, and that's what we did and everything else around it, you know, you're going to get in whatever organisation you're in. Yeah. Um, what impact do you think your volunteering or, or your, your, your the you and your volunteers there had on the wider society? Oh gosh, mm. I, I don't know what impact we had on wider society. I like to think um, that some of the people who uh, came, there, came in there, whether they came for help or whether they came to volunteer or just came to see what was going on and hang around there to see if they could do anything. I would like to think that it stayed inside of them for all of their lives, you know. Uh, and also some of the social work placements who came there. I know that one of them, he heard, I heard that he heard a negative comment um, when he was in a training and he was able to uh, defend, you know, the project, you know, because you can imagine uh, <clears throat> certain people in the establishment had their own ideas about what we did there. I mean, I, I couldn't help everyone who came in there, you know, that it was the, the day and age. Um, but I know that this particular man, he stood up for us, he defended us, you know, he, ob he obviously, he had done a placement there and he obviously had got a lot from it and saw that we were trying to do our best um, in the circumstances. Um, yeah, so, and also I, I understand um, that at the very least that the project, there were different projects that continued in that building, so that was a good thing in itself, you know. I think these type of projects are difficult to quantify, you know, that um, it's, it's sometimes difficult to put a, a worth or a value um, and an awareness on 
the number of people that um, benefited in a way. But I think um, a lot of people who came in there um, uh, did benefit. And I would say, I may be wrong, but my opinion is that especially some of the people who came in and were regulars coming in there because I think they were respected and uh, valued and yeah, I think so. What do you think uh, volunteering gave you personally? Yeah, oh God, that's an interesting question, isn't it? You asked me earlier, did I do any other volunteering work? And I, I <laughs> do you know what? I think I'm, I'm almost still doing it. You won't believe this. The work I do now, when I went to live in Holland, it was just like a, a miracle because I wanted to earn my living doing this work I do now, which is stimulating potentials through music and movement and the group situation. And there, what I do became my absolute full-time work. I mean, I was doing it with the Police Academy, Genesis Consulting, weekly groups with 50 or 60 people. But I came back to UK and it's taken ages to get it going again. You know, my international work goes, but here you could say I go to, to groups and I do it basically free of cost because I don't get enough people. But the point is, I love doing what I do. And I say, if I get one person, it's worth it. So I was thinking that to a certain extent, <laughs> some of my other work has to fund what I, what I do here, because I brought this thing here. There were not many teachers here. There still aren't many teachers here, but I believe in it. And so I do it, even though I don't earn much money here doing it. So in that respect, you know, so what it leads me then to think is that obviously I get something from it, don't I? I get something from that, but, you know, I only, my only wish would be that every single person in the whole world would be in a similar situation, that they would get something and feel something good from doing something for, for someone else. That would be my desire because I don't think the world would be in the state it's in if everyone felt good when they helped someone else, you know, or when they did something for someone else, you know. So, but I'm only saying that maybe it was something in me that clearly it was something in me that wanted to. I don't, yeah, I think a lot of people feel that in the teenage years, isn't it? They, they want to save the world. They think they can, but not everyone. Maybe if everyone did, it could happen, but a lot of people do, I think, so, during that time. But it's in my DNA, I think. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. In, in a nutshell, what does volunteering mean for you now? Right, okay. I wish there was no need for anyone to volunteer to do anything. Okay, that's the first thing. I feel quite radical in that um, I don't believe there should be the need for volunteers because I think we have a government that should be the protectors and the safety net of the people. And I know that in some countries that does exist, like in de places like Denmark and Finland, the governments make sure that everyone, and Netherlands too, make sure that people are happy and have the circumstances to flourish. Safety nets. In our culture, um, we don't have that, um, that type of system. So it's necessary then to have volunteers. We have to have volunteers. But I don't believe that in a, a really true uh, you know, good, proper working culture that there would be a need for volunteers. In my opinion, there should not be the need, nor for charities neither. I think, why? When we have a government who is there to serve the people, protect the people, make safety nets for everyone, we should only really be in a situation in life of now, how am I going to flourish my potentials? How am I going to grow myself as a human being? 
She didn't have to worry about all the, where am I going to get the next thing to pay my rent? Where am I going to get the next thing? You know, but people can't flourish when they're, so then that's, we do need the, yeah. We have to do the work that the government is supposed to be doing because you can't just let people, you know, sort of uh, suffer. Thank you very much, Antoinette. Pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>